One of the programs I'm especially looking forward to this season consists of two masterpieces that I really love, but which many of you may not know. The first is Stravinsky's ballet, Apollo. Now we all know his three early ballets, The Firebird, Petrushka, and The Rite of Spring. But by the 1920s, Stravinsky had moved away from explicitly Russian influences towards neoclassicism, which means looking back to music of the past for inspiration. And Apollo is in many ways the opposite of The Rite of Spring, where The Rite of Spring is all about the earth and pounding rhythms and a pagan people. Apollo is unrelentingly otherworldly and beautiful and about the muses and the gods. It was written in 1927 for string orchestra, and that alone is interesting because previously Stravinsky had talked about his suspicion of string instruments. He thought that they were too expressive and he preferred the kind of block-like sound of wind instruments. So choosing to write for a string orchestra is already something very interesting about this piece. The ballet tells the story of the Greek god Apollo, and we follow him from his birth on earth to his ascension into heaven and adult immortality. In the story, he's visited by three muses, Calliope, the muse of poetry, Polyphemia, the muse of mime, and Terpsichore, the muse of rhythm and dance. The music is in the tradition of the 17th and 18th century French music, and it echoes composers like Lully in the first movement with its dotted rhythms, which sound like a French overture. But there's also a really lush, uh, almost indulgent melodic quality to this music, which we get from French grand opera. So, Apollo and the Muses. At the very beginning, we meet Apollo, and he's represented by a virtuosic violin solo. Then each of the three muses is introduced, and Apollo dances a variation with them, before he eventually leads them to Parnassus. The end of the piece is the end of Apollo's earthly life, and Stravinsky gives us a deeply moving but somehow quite objective, chilling, ice cold, hard as a diamond, crystalline music, which has incredible power as we imagine Apollo ascending from earth to heaven. Like his last three symphonies, there's a mystery surrounding the C minor mass. We don't really know why Mozart wrote it. There was no commission, and he wasn't in the habit of writing anything without a specific occasion in mind. But the impetus was probably Mozart's discovery of the music of Bach and Handel in 1782. Old music was not a usual place to look for inspiration in Mozart's time. Today, we're very used to looking to the music of the past to get ideas. Stravinsky was inspired by the past, and there's a great tradition of neoclassicism in modern music. But in Mozart's time, novelty was the order of the day. Audiences wanted to hear new things. They wanted treats for their ears. They wanted surprise. So the fact that Mozart was looking back was really unusual. The C minor mass is a work of enormous grandeur, even though it isn't liturgically complete. Having said that, it has the most extraordinary breadth and range of musical styles. Mozart grabs everything that he's learnt from Bach and Handel and incorporates it into his own musical language and we feel like he's discovered a new topic of conversation, new compositional ideas. Some of my favorite moments are the pleading Kyrie, the words of the Mass which say, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, in which we can imagine the chorus talking directly to God and begging for forgiveness. Mozart scores this piece for double choir, so you'll see our chorus divided in two, split on either side of the stage. And this gives the most incredible conversational effect to the music the whole way through. The quoniam, the text that says, only you are holy, only you are God, is set as a trio for two sopranos and tenor. And the sopranos imitate each other in the most wonderful way. One will soar up to a high note, and then just as she's descending, the second soprano will reach the same high note. And this has the most wonderful effect, both in telling us the text, this emphatic text saying, only you are God. But the beauty of Mozart's writing for the soprano voice also reminds us of what a great opera composer he was. The Jacksonville Symphony and Chorus is joined for these performances by a dream team cast of soloists. Kira Duffy and Janine Dubique, sopranos, Lawrence Williford, tenor, 
and Philip Cutlip bass. All singers that I've worked with before and are really wonderful at this repertoire. It's going to be a very special occasion and I hope you'll join us.